good afternoon. Good morning from Paris. And uh, my name is Emmanuel Maître and I'm a research fellow at the FRS. It's my great pleasure to open this virtual webinar on North Korean short range missiles. This webinar aims at presenting a report that was recently completed and published by FRS on this topic. Before I delve into the content of the study and turn to our panelists, uh, let me present to you the context in which uh, this work has been done. This uh, publication and today's event is part of a continuous series of activities that the Foundation for Strategic Research is conducting with the support of the European Union. These activities aim at uh, promoting the universalization of the Hague Code of Conduct and to foster a constructive uh, and inclusive dialogue on ballistic missile proliferation itself. The Hague Code of Conduct is the only multilateral instrument regulating the uh, ballistic missiles through confidence building, transparency, and uh, political commitments to restraint on the development of systems. It was adopted in 2002, and it has now currently 143 member states. In the context of this project, we at FRS uh, proposed to the European, European External Action Service to explore one aspect of ballistic missile proliferation, that is the development of sophisticated short-range systems. This report assesses uh, North Korea's recent development of short-range ballistic missiles and their likely specifications. It evaluates vulnerabilities posed by these uh, short-range systems and long-range rockets uh, on South Korean and US military infrastructures. Finally, it offers recommendations based on existing non-proliferation instruments uh, and focuses in particular on the EU's role. It exploits unpublished satellite imagery and presents original analysis on the likely capabilities of these systems. And in particular, uh, we're going to talk about it, the KM23, 24, and 25. I will uh, give the floor to the authors of the study. Uh, but before I do, just a few practical elements. First, uh, as you have seen, this event is on the record and will be available online in a few days. Uh, second, we are going to let uh, the authors present their work for about uh, 25 minutes, then uh, Mr. Van Van Diepen will react to the paper for about 10 minutes. And finally, we will open the floor for Q&A to the audience. So please feel free to prepare comments and questions. The questions will be collected uh, in written form in the Q&A or in the chat section. With that, I will uh, turn to our uh, authors and panelists and first to Antoine Pombas, research fellow at FRS, who will present the general context of the report and its main findings. And then we will hear uh, Christian Mer, who is currently an associate fellow, research fellow at the FRS, uh, who will present his methodology for producing new assessments uh, for the specifications of the systems. Uh, and finally, Stéphane Delory, a senior research fellow at FRS, will go more into details concerning the systems under development in North Korea and their consequences for the strategic balance on the peninsula. Antoine, I'll let you lead the way and present the report. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Emmanuel. Good afternoon, good morning to some of you, and good evening if you are currently in Asia. Uh, my aim here first in a few minutes is just to present the overall uh, aspects of the uh, of, of the study that we've been conducting that uh, Stéphane Delory has been mostly conduct conducting as the lead author. Uh, of, of course, it came from the assessments that, especially in Europe, the attention uh, given to short French systems in, in North Korea and in the Korean Peninsula was not big enough and that we needed actually to kind of fill the gap in the literature on the technical and uh, operational assessment on the development of short range ballistic systems uh, by uh, North Korea. So as Emmanuel explained in the framework of the Ashcock, uh, we got uh, an agreement and uh, we got enabled to study these short range missile, both their technical uh, characterization, their operational impact, their political actually uh, impact as well. In that very long study that uh, was made public a few days ago, even though we started working on it actually more than two years ago. Uh, the publication of this study in these uh, last few days is actually uh, quite timely, of course, with what's happening in the in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and the idea, of course, was to say that we have both kind of trends that create window opportunity for the DPRK. Uh, we have a rapidly changing threat perception in the ROK 
towards the GPRK threat. And third, there is, of course, the importance of being aware of the challenges in the Korean Peninsula. So very uh, briefly, because that's not, once again, the core of uh, the study, but the three trends uh, that we consider a great window of opportunity for the DPRK are further trivialization. There have been so many ballistic tests, including, of course, short range missile tests over the last few years that they have become kind of trivialized, that uh, we tend to get used to these tests. Second, there is a distraction, distraction, of course, with the war in Ukraine, with the eyes being uh, mostly on the European uh, security system much more than on the Northeast Asian uh, one. And third, the division, the division of the international community, because for the very first time last May 2022, Russia and China vetoed a resolution, a project of resolution, condemning and sanctioning uh, the DPRK long range uh, missile test. So the three, of course, trends create window of opportunity for the DPRK to continue developing its uh, ballistic program, including the short range ones. And it has actually huge impact, of course, on the threat perception of the DPRK in uh, the Republic of Korea. Of course, capacities, second, the threat, a repeated threat formulated by North Korean leaders, uh, including as early as April 2022 by uh, the younger assistant Kim Yo-jong. Then, of course, during summer and recently in December uh, 31st by the leader uh, Kim Jong-un, but also the evolution of the doctrine. I mean, I'm not going to focus on it today, but uh, in September, when the nuclear doctrine of the DPRK was uh, altered and uh, newly uh, modified. Uh, of course, it has three impacts in terms of the importance of being aware of the challenges. The first one, of course, the case of non-proliferation, be it from North Korea, but also the proliferation that might uh, be the consequence in other countries, of course, with a renewed debate in South Korea on the nuclearization of the country, either with the reintroduction of uh, U.S. tactical weapons that, of course, were withdrawn in 1991, or the development of an indige indigenous uh, nuclear uh, capacities. And second, the question of the cohesion bit within the US ROK alliance, but also the cohesion between the Republic of Korea and its international partners, including in Europe. And of course, the necessity to work on the world case scenario that could impact directly European interest uh, in uh, the Korean Peninsula and more broadly uh, in the Indo Pacific. Just a very short caveat before. Uh, Christian Mer can start explaining the methodology that was used. Uh, we've worked on open sources with an attempt to assess, once again, technical characteristic of the North Korean ballistic threat. Uh, our conclusion may differ from a general or official uh, assessment. Um, what is quite important, of course, is it has inferences both in terms of proliferation, but also in terms of political, of military option and political consequences. Uh, we have focused primarily on the DPRK shock range systems. Once again, it's normal not to address the issue of the long range system that has been addressed a lot in the recent literature. And last but not least, of course, these views expressed only. Uh, those of the authors, so uh, Stéphane, Christian, uh, and I. So I will give the floor to uh, Christian for him to explain the methodology we've used, including on the characterization of the missile, and then Stéphane will explain in much more uh, details and in depth uh, the military consequences and the operational consequences of the development of this North Korean short-range missile. Christian, if you may. Yes, thank you, Stéphane. Um, just a few words about uh, methodology. Um, this North Korea uh, short range ballistic missile capability assessment has focused on the three most recent ballistic systems in terms of uh, demonstration and implementation. The technical analysis was uh, facilitated by the fact that uh, North Korea presented those systems during several periods and as well as during some flight tests. The methodology implemented uh, consisted of uh, detailed analysis of the dimensions first of the KN 23, 24, and 25. Based on reference elements, for example, the dimensions of the mobile launcher, which are known, the dimensioning obtained was then compared and confronted 
with similar system known in other countries. It was then possible to deduce the possible internal configurations and then to make a critical analysis of the announced performances. It should be noted that the results obtained are estimates and that they are subject to criticism. Indeed, we have sometimes found values that match with the values announced by other open sources, but sometimes also it's quite different values. And this is where the study is interesting because it offers line of thought that must be corroborated and cross-checked. As a result, the technological level reached by North Korea is quite impressive. Firstly, because the technical and operational characteristics of the system studied differ completely with previous developments in this country. Transition from liquid propulsion to solid propulsion, for example, navigation, guidance, types of trajectories, precision, all those specificities are at the best level compared to what is being done in the world for this class of ballistic missile. The production capacity is also impressive with a highly developed industrial tool as demonstrated by all the flight tests carried out in 2022. There is clearly a stated desire for power, but this desire is not just a facade display. It is demonstrated by the flight tests accomplished, there are large number and the performances achieved. There are still many areas of uncertainty in our assessment. For example, the type and nature of fetal material use, the type of propellant employed, the performance and nature of the driving system, and in particular, the terminal driving, the payload masses also. But the available data allow us to get a sufficiently precise idea of the capabilities of the system studied for us to be able to make comments on the level of sophistication reached by North Korea. This country is on a slope of technological progress that must be constantly monitored and analyzed. We can be sure that new, even more efficient systems are already being in progress in terms of design and development. Now I give the floor to Stefan. Ton micro, Stefan. Stéphane, you're on mute, we can't hear you. Excuse me. Is it better? Yes. So I will talk about the, the free uh, missile that North Korea has tested and deployed uh, the last five years, uh, which are the KN-23, KN-24 and KN-25. Uh, the test launches uh, give useful information about the specification and um, possible military effects. Any assessment of the DPRK news capabilities must consider how whole and, and new system may be interlinked, what military option could emerge, but also what limitation remains. We only consider the possible impacts for non-nuclear operation, but in a context where the threat of use of nuclear weapon would be high. Uh, one of the purpose of the study is to highlight the risk posed by short-range system, conventional and, chem and chemical, as they appear as useful tools of coercion in a context where North Korea is more able to exert aggressive sanctuarization. Uh, this weapon may have substantial impact in military operation and on DPRS perception of the outcome of the conflict. So next slide, thanks. Uh, the KN-23 has been described as a copy of the SS-26E, uh, the export version of the Russian SS-26 26M. For very close to the SS 26E, the KN 23 may be longer and larger. The load of propellant may be heavier than, the, than on the SS 26E, possibly around 4,000 kilograms. The mass of the casing is unknown, but may be equivalent or lighter than of the SS 26. 
launch on a purely based trajectory, its range seems to be inferior to this of the SS26M, leading to conclude that the propellant may be less energetic than the propellant of the SS26. You have the characteristic of the of the missile just under uh, in the in the two uh, the, the shame and the and the chart. Next, please. So uh, we we have some characterization of the trajectory of the KN23 uh, since uh, North Korean officials claim that KN23 performs a maneuver during its flight. Open sources illustrate this, the type of maneuver, uh, which is a hypersonic bounce around uh, 15 kilometers of altitude to extend its range to probably something like 20%. The characteristic has never been previously observed on the SS26, which maneuver at the end of its trajectory. But unfortunately, the information are very scarce on the trajectory of the SS26. So KN23 is a quasi-ballistic missile, but can have an unusually low apogee less than 40 kilometers of altitude, it could be able to maneuver along its trajectory and perform terminal maneuvers. The missile is probably capable of penetrating missile defense and was probably designed specifically for this mission. Next, please. The characteristic of the KN24 uh, and KN25 are a little bit different. It's nearly the same for the KN24, which is clearly inspired from the heavy guided rocket uh, MGM-140, which is better known as uh, Atakamis, uh, which is a heavy guided rocket. But uh, obviously, the KN24 is not the result of reverse engineering of this rocket in particular. It is plausible that it was developed as a national system with few imported parts. The missile could bounce on the atmosphere and is major leap for the, NK, the North Korean industry if it's essentially made in North Korea. The KN-25 is more disturbing uh, since its characteristics are rather unique. Uh, it's not a quasi-ballistic missile, but a navigated uh, rocket and its flight is ballistic, but combines very uh, long range more than 200 kilometers with very, very low apogees, uh, which are in fact uh, under 30 kilometers and rather high accuracy. It is also clearly optimized for overcoming missile defense. The KN-25 may have been nationally conceived by North Korea and uh, appears to be adapted to South Korean battlefield specificities, missile defense, hardening of artillery, of artillery bases, redeployment of the US logistic in depth, etc. One of the problems uh, which is linked to uh, the development of new missile is its, uh, is its their accuracy. And so uh, several tests uh, were carried out with direct, direct hits on the Alsom Islet uh, by North Korea, uh, which showcased the test to underline uh, the supposed accuracy of the weapon. An evaluation of the accuracy can be made using a current map, namely radar satellite images taken with an interval of several days showing the existence of discrepancies on the ground at different times. The current, the current map of EU satellite, uh, Sentinel satellite images taken in an interval of 12 days shows that some events took place at the same location where impact were recorded by the North Korean media. Also more images taken at shorter intervals, intervals are needed. It seems likely that all three missiles hit the, the island. The CEP of the KN23 and KN24 could be between uh, 35 and 60 meters, with the CEP of the KN25 so much higher. It is plausible that this missile were guided by an initial guidance system coupled to a GNSS. The high accuracy give North Korea new opportunities to convention for conventional strikes against military targets, but also ease the use of chemical munitions in the depth of the South Korean territory. Concerning missile defense, North Korean program appears to prove that missile defense have forced Pyongyang into a major modernization effort. Uh, short -front, their short front missiles are likely to overcome current missile defenses, uh, but it doesn't uh, mean that these defense are unnecessary. Current US 
U.S. thirty agencies are being modernized, modernized through the IBCS program and PAC-3 and fast radar modernization. South Korea has also made significant investment to develop and deploy a robust architecture. The so deployment of KN25 will require heavy invest investment in CRAM, which is counter, uh, counter rocket system, uh, for which North Korea, uh, South Korea is uh, currently deprived. <coughs> Current defenses can probably success successfully cope with the older part of the arsenal and can be expected to gradually cope with, it, with its modernized part, notably through IBCS. Advanced missile defense development in South Korea will likely limit North Korea's military option, including potential coercive strategies based on limited strike strikes against high value targets. Next, please. There are uh, nonetheless emerging vulnerabilities. On the tactical level, KN24 and KN24 5 may generate vulnerabilities against logistic points hardened position, troop concentration, and so on. North Korea may consider a massive tactical strike in the depth of the battlefield. So KN-23 is potentially useful against static uh, missile defense, strategic logistic nodes, strategic airbase in the southern, the southern part of the peninsula, and all kinds of non hardened infrastructure targets. If sufficiently, sufficiently, sufficiently accurate, the heavy version of the KN-23 may be suited for alternate targets destruction, but also to massive dispersion of some munitions or chemical agents. Coupled with adequate C4 ISR, all these missiles may be able to engage mobile missile defense. Uh, the accuracy of the three types of missiles is probably sufficient to consider chemical strike against mid targets, military targets with reduced, with uh, all the necessary uh, collateral damage. Next, please. Uh, here are an example of vulnerabilities generated by high precision missile able to overcome missile defenses. Even defended by two batteries of pack three anti missile systems, the fat batteries may be vulnerable. All equipment on the site could be targeted with few missiles with some munition or even IT yield unitary munition. Next, please. And here is, uh, is an example of other artery position built to support enduring US and South Korean military operation along the DMZ. This site may, also, may now be vulnerable to heavy guided rockets, notably to the KN25 and smaller KN09. Uh, Allied bases, logistic nodes, and uh, other military infrastructure are also vulnerable in the depth or in a depth of more than uh, 100 kilometers. Next. And so there are a lot of, que of questions that can be raised uh, and also some limits. Uh, currently, North Korean C4 IS shortcomings limit its ability to precision strike if US and South Korea forces are dispersed. Stock limitation prevents any strategy solely based on conventional strikes. A new missile system may be used for coercion strategies uh, which, with, with threat of use against selected high value targets, for instance, semiconductor facilities or even use uh, against military targets. Theater missile defense are high value targets that are currently very vulnerable. Probability of a chemical strike may remain high, gen generating, generating paralyzing effect hindering reinforcement to the front. And the constant modernization of the DPRK strategic forces and their potential ability to strike the US with nuclear weapons and to use tactical nuclear weapons on the South Korean territory raise the question of the South Korean and US response, responses in case of limited use of chemical weapons against military targets. On the contrary, military defense modernization combined with an effective passive defense are solutions for very expensive. Building an effective counter-strike capability may be sufficient to ward off limited coercive strategies, but North Korea, North Korea increasing capability in terms of chemical strike are, uh, are very problematic. Should uncertainties raised about the US response in case of chemical use, Pyongyang may gain confidence in its ability to manage a high-intensity conflict under the nuclear threshold, opening the way for provocation and an outspoken coercive strategy. And towards the conclusion, I'll give you the floor, Antoine. 
Thank you, uh, Stefan. So very briefly, I mean, uh, one of the uh, lessons we draw from the technical and military uh, analysis of these short-range missiles is the need, of course, to uh, strengthen the framework in which we analyze uh, ballistic threats and the risk of proliferation. The first one, of course, is to uh, focus not only on long-range and short, but also on short range capacities. Uh, to be clear, underestimating the role of the short range systems in the growing expansions of North Korea's military option on peninsula opened the way actually for aggressive strategy of coercion and lead, it led actually to, to a neglect of the determined parameter of instability in, in the Korean Peninsula. So it's quite important, of course, to not only focus on the long range missile, we've always been doing it, but also on the short range. Second, of course, is to focus not only on the quantitative uh, analysis of the side of the arsenal, but also on the qualitative aspects of uh, the arsenal, especially the accuracy and the uh, defense penetration capability of these different uh, systems. Third, to focus not only on the military, but also the political dimensions, because some um, military coercion from the North Korean side could trigger a lot of political uh, impact. Actually, one of the debates in South Korea today, once again, on the nuclearization of the country is a direct consequence of the developments of these uh, short range, but also, of course, the tactical weapons, tactical nuclear weapons uh, in North Korea. Uh, fourth, and but you will read it in the study, the importance of the direct and indirect uh, impact. Uh, to be clear, for example, the decoupling function of the strategic arsenal uh, contributes directly to the military function of the non strategic arsenal, and both aspects of the threat, for example, should be addressed as a whole and not uh, selectively. And the development of North Korean short range strike systems have also significant economic impacts by their very existence, by reducing, for example, the investor confidence in the long term resilience of the South Korean uh, economy, even in the absence of a conflict. And fifth, last but not least, but as always, to focus on tangible, but also intangible technology transfer that would help us some time to better understand how the North can have been so successfully able to develop these short range uh, missiles. We also conclude the study with very uh, short policy uh, recommendation, of course, to keep on uh, for the EU to do uh, what they've been doing over the last uh, 10, 20 uh, years regarding the North Korean uh, ballistic uh, arsenals. So of course, to even more strengthen the European declaratory diplomacy in response to the ballistic missile test and make sure that there is a clear condemnation of every single violation of the United Nations Security Council resolution by North Korea. Second, to keep raising the issue of North Korean ballistic missile proliferation in international uh, forum. This is already what the, uh, of course, EAS is doing uh, at the Conference of Disarmament through the HCOC, et cetera. But we need to make sure that the issue of North Korean ballistic missile proliferation is being addressed both in the UN General Assembly at the Conference of Disarmament, within the HCOC, at the NPT preparatory committees and review conferences, uh, etc. Uh, third, to keep promoting uh, European expertise in ballistic missile non-proliferation through, of course, studies, but for example, with the creation of a database that could be uh, promoted and used for an annual uh, publication, and to make sure that European researchers can take part in international conferences, cycles such as the IISS uh, Missile Dialogue Initiative, the 3AF uh, Integrated Air and Missile Defense Conference, the RUSI uh, Missile Defense Conference, uh, etc. And one of the vehicle that can be used is also, of course, the existing EU non-proliferation in disarmament uh, consortium that was established more than 10 years ago uh, in 2010. Uh, fourth, to provide even greater support to the UN group of experts and to make sure that the UN group of experts is focusing on these short range ballistic uh, missiles as much uh, as possible. And why not to appoint a ninth expert representing the EU 
uh, within uh, the panel uh, of experts. And fifth, of course, for the EU to even more deepen the strategic partnership with South Korea and to focus also with growing cooperation with some uh, research institutes, such as the South Korean Korea Institute for Defense Analysis, KIDA, or the Institute of National Security Strategy, the INSS, both, of course, based uh, in Seoul. So this was a very brief overview of uh, the study. Of course, you have the link to the much longer uh, version of uh, the uh, study, and I will now uh, open the floor to uh, Van Van Diepen, Mr. Van Van Diepen, of course, for your remarks and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Antoine. Uh, Mr. Van Diepen, I'm just going to uh, present you very shortly. I think most people will, will know you in the, in the room, but just to remind that you have a rich uh, career in the US administration. Uh, you served in particular as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Non-Proliferation. Uh, you are a world-renowned uh, expert in missile proliferation, and in particular, the DPRK. Uh, and I really wanted, uh, on behalf of the FRS team, to thank you for being with us today, but also for the very valuable review of the uh, earlier draft of the of the report that you that you made. Uh, so many many thanks from uh, our part, and uh, I am happy to give you the floor. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, so I wanted to, to thank you and, and FRS for the opportunity to participate in the webinar, and I want to really again thank the authors for their tremendous efforts. Uh, and for their extremely important and valuable study. I'm gonna take a few minutes to highlight what I see as the most important contributions and the most novel insights of the study. Uh, and in the process, I think I'll flag a few issues that those of you in the audience might wanna follow up on in the discussion period. Um, obviously the study's main contribution is in, in giving long overdue prominence to North Korea's short range ballistic missile force which is commonly overlooked in favor of Pyongyang's development of nuclear weapons and longer range missiles. Just as important, the study prioritizes the conventional warfighting role of North Korea's SRBMs, which again is often lost in all the flapping of over nuclear weapons, despite the high likelihood that any conflict on the peninsula will almost certainly at least begin conventionally. I also appreciate the fact that the study did not ignore North Korea's chemical warfare capability. Uh, and the role of SRBMs in deep chemical strikes. Now, one of the main frustrations in analyzing North Korean missiles is that the lack of detailed information. Indeed, the bulk of what we have to work with <clears throat> is released by the North Koreans themselves. But the authors have worked intensively and creatively to exploit that limited data. For example, using photos and videos released by Pyongyang to infer missile sizes, the weight of high explosive and missile warheads, and the accuracy demonstrated in certain missile tests. The study provides a real service in assessing the actual combat impact of North Korea's SRBMs against important operational target sets, looking at the effects of various types and sizes of payloads, and especially the contribution of missile accuracy to battlefield lethality. The study shows quite clearly the significant increase in North Korea's conventional warfighting capability provided by its new, more accurate SRBMs against key economic, political, and military targets. It also shows how more accurate SRBMs improve the North's chemical delivery effectiveness. These conclusions are backed up by a detailed discussion of the factors contributing to the accuracy of the new missiles, including an examination of the potential role of global navigation satellite systems such as GPS and GLONASS. Another important contribution of the study is its extensive look at the interplay between North Korea's SRBMs and allied missile defenses on the peninsula. Although I might take issue with the conclusion that penetrating missile defenses was the primary driver behind the North's new SRBMs and their use of so-called quasi-ballistic trajectories that remain entirely within the atmosphere, the study clearly describes the capability of the new SRBMs to complicate missile defense. In addition to providing thematic treatments of issues such as missile accuracy and missile defenses, the study provides in-depth individual analyses of each of the new SRBMs, the KN-23, KN-24, and KN-25. In particular, it adds a great deal to the discussion of the KN-25, which has been overlooked in most other analyses in favor of the KN-23 in particular. I applaud the authors for coming up with their answer to one of the most common questions about the new missiles. Why did North Korea develop so many different types? 
In their view, the CAN-25 is geared to strikes in the immediate battlefield area against troop concentrations and the like. The CAN-24 to saturation strikes against operational level targets like air bases and logistic hubs. And the CAN-23 to deep strikes against defended targets. The study also identifies some important trade-offs implied by the new missiles. The trade-off between producing CAN-23, CAN-24s and producing CAN-25s that use much more propellant. The trade-off between producing solid propellant SRBMs and longer range solid missiles. The trade-off between range extension and defense penetration in conducting CAN-3 and CAN-24 skipping maneuvers. And the trade-off between accuracy and altitude and thus range in tests of the CAN-25. I also appreciated the fact that the authors identified well beforehand, even though the study is only being released now, two notable aspects of missile combat revealed in recent events. The impact of missiles targeting electricity networks, as we are now seeing in Ukraine, and the contribution of missile targeting from small reconnaissance drones, as we are seeing in Ukraine, and is being foreshadowed by North Korea's recent drone flights over the South. Understandably, the study is focused on the technical and operational aspects of North Korea's new SRBMs, but it does not ignore the big picture, discussing what the new SRBMs mean for North Korean military options in crisis and conflict. It concludes that the new missiles, by being able to damage key targets more effectively with conventional warheads and better penetrate missile defenses, expand the North's military options and allow it to be more discriminating and precise in limited uses of force. It also usefully points out how allied missile defenses can complicate such limited strikes by lowering the North's expectation of success unless it increases the scale of attack to overcome defenses, thus increasing the risk of unwanted escalation. And the study concludes with some solid practical recommendations for ways European policymakers can have an impact on the issue, particularly the need for Europeans to emphasize North Korean missiles in international fora, provide greater support to the UN panel of experts on North Korea, and deepen strategic partnerships with South Korea. So let me conclude at this point by again thanking FRS and the authors, and by hoping that the observations that I have drawn from the study will provide useful food for thought in the upcoming discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, for these uh, remarks, and, and once again for your uh, general contribution to, to this report. Um, we have a few uh, minutes, actually, at least uh, uh, 15 minutes to, to discuss with our uh, audience today and have a couple of uh, questions that I will uh, submit to, to the panel. Um, I will uh, maybe select three at this stage. Uh, the first one is to uh, ask if the DPRK has ever acknowledged the position of chemical weapons. And I think maybe we can give a few uh, specification of what we know or, or not uh, on this uh, capacity by, by North Korea, not, not much, I'm sure, but it's an interesting aspect of the study, as uh, Van mentioned, so maybe uh, we can uh, develop a little bit this, this aspect. Uh, there is a question uh, that uh, we also received. Do you have an estimation of DPRK's production capacity and the cost of the SRBM program since the beginning of massive launches in 2022? Uh, so that would be uh, interesting maybe to mention something that is uh, indeed in the in the report. We don't have, I think, the, the cost itself, but some elements on the, the production capacity. So maybe, uh, Stéphane, especially, you can um, develop that. And uh, I think uh, another uh, general question uh, we had on which you can uh, go back is the question of the modernization of missile defense on the peninsula. It was uh, mentioned a little bit uh, already, but maybe this is something we can elaborate on a little bit, both in terms of uh, technicality, maybe you can explain a little bit, uh, Stefan, how the changes that you mentioned may uh, impact uh, the, the role and how they are linked also to the development of these weapons. Uh, and maybe, Antoine, politically, you can uh, a little bit um, elaborate on how, what is the demand for, for missile defense and how indeed the development of these systems and the flurry of launches we have seen in, in recent years has impacted the, the debate on the, in, in, in the country. So maybe we can uh, start with Stefan and uh, then uh, Christian, you uh, tell me if you have anything to add. Uh, concerning the propagal production, uh, as far as we, as we know in open sources, we, we don't have any clue. And uh, it, it it would need uh, 
a new study in a, in a way because uh, you, you you cannot you cannot have any any clue uh, solely with the, with the test and uh, you, you you can see that uh, a lot of uh, solid propellant is used but uh, it's very very difficult to quantify it so uh, we we only may be able to know something if we could spot the the factories and the facilities and so it's uh, it's work that remains to be done and uh, concerning missile defense uh, there is some question about uh, other capabilities uh, which are currently uh, not sufficiently developed to allow the interception of this kind of missile and uh, concerning the modernization in, in South Korea through IBCS, uh, the, the, the great deal is to, is to couple uh, very short range uh, radar and interceptors to a uh, longer one. Uh, in a way, you, you are able to couple something like a Stinger to a, to a FAD through the same architecture. And so uh, uh, through the distribution of uh, sensors, you are much more able to uh, detect and characterize the trajectory of the missile, uh, notably uh, at short altitude, and it helps a lot to uh, intercept. It's something that has to be done, uh, and it's something that only the US masters, and uh, it's something that will be um, rather politically difficult for South Korea to, uh, to plug on, uh, because um, uh, this kind of, of architecture is very, very expensive and it's give a lot of, a lot of control uh, for the US uh, on its allies. So it's politically rather complicated to, to, to go with it. But it's currently one of the main options uh, to maintain missile defense uh, capability against uh, this kind of missiles. And I think that's all. Thanks. On the technical uh, aspects, Christian, do you have anything you want to add at this stage? You, you're on mute. Still. Is it, is it yeah. okay? Um, on the technical aspect, there is a question of the possibility that the new SLBM will be used or uh, will be used uh, as an anti-aircraft carrier killer. And the question is, uh, is it possible, if I understand? Um, I would say that it's uh, a very difficult task uh, that is uh, first uh, not given to the SLBM, uh, as we know, for example, in uh, China, but uh, uh, for IRBMs or uh, ICBMs, and uh, it's a very difficult uh, task uh, because, uh, as we know, the, the, and as we said, uh, the North Korean uh, ballistic missiles are precise uh, with a good precision. But uh, the difference with an aircraft carrier killer is that the, 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 the target is moving. and. Um, I don't know if uh, North Korea has the possibility to uh, have a very uh, sophisticated uh, guidance system, which would be capable to update the data during the flight uh, to make a uh, correction on the trajectory and to, uh, to target uh, this, uh, this aircraft carrier, which is uh, moving. So uh, for me, it would be a very difficult task. Thank you. Uh, Antoine, maybe you can address the question that uh, Stefan left out on, on chemical weapons. I don't know if you have anything to add. There was this question of kind of the reaction in South Korea, both on uh, uh, missile defense itself, but the, those uh, launches. Uh, and maybe also there are two questions that are uh, kind of related on uh, technology transfer and what we expect in terms of uh, uh, arms sales and, and missile proliferation. Uh, do we have any reasons to, to believe it's something that's mentioned in, in the report? At this stage, are there uh, elements to, to really fear that North Korea might be tempted to uh, export those technologies or even systems? 
Sure. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, on the very first question of the chemical weapons, uh, as you know, there have been few reports over the last few years. One was published, if I remember well, last year by the Rain Corporation in partnership with the Assan Institute for Policy Studies based in Seoul. Uh, there were a report by the Belfast Center at Harvard a few years ago, etc. But we don't have actually a huge contemporary uh, and recent report on the chemical weapons uh, capacity. Most of the current reports are just a compilation of existing and previous uh, reports. So actually to, to, to have kind of, uh, uh, to, to, to work on the issue, to try to, from satellite imagery, potentially to identify chemical weapons facilities, et cetera, could be quite interesting. On the North Korean side, officially, they have not the knowledge recently to have uh, chemical uh, weapons. Uh, just a reminder that North Korea is one of the only uh, country never to have signed uh, the Convention on the Prohibition of the Development, Production, Stockpiling and Use of Chemical Weapons and on their destruction. Uh, when in 2013 the issue was right, of course, to get rid of the Syrian uh, chemical weapons. The uh, analysis, I would say the convergence with North Korea was not made. I'm not saying that North Korea was the one in charge or, or, or helping Syria on that, but the analogy of, okay, let's get rid of the North of, of the Syrian chemical weapons. And what do we do with the potential North Korean uh, chemical weapons? Why well, not was not addressed actually uh, 10 years ago. So that's something that is kind of out of the rudder that uh, would be uh, interesting to discuss much more in depth, but of course to have uh, before that more uh, details, more analysis, uh, better assessments on the current capacity, not only being based on compilation of previous data once again, but to have kind of fresh or, or new uh, data. Uh, on the issue of the exports of some weapon system, etc. cetera, and including North Korea providing uh, weapons or system to uh, other countries. On the issue of Russia, it has not been demonstrated yet. Of course, uh, some uh, news article in, in some US intelligence were worry of some transfer. Uh, it seems that Russia may have asked North Korea to some of this transfer, but we have not assessed yet at least some evidence of North Korean artillery shell or else being used in uh, Ukraine. I'm not saying that nothing is being used, just that we don't know for sure and we have no evidence yet or we have not have evidence that uh, artillery shells or else could be uh, used uh, in, in Ukraine by uh, the Russian. Uh, on the proliferation of uh, missile system or at least technology, that was one of the conclusion was the, the need of course to, to work on tangible and intangible uh, technologies. Uh, of course, more uh, details would be quite interesting. Uh, many have been working on the North Korea-Iran nexus over the last uh, few years, uh, but on this shock range missile, of course, much more in-depth uh, analysis uh, would be worthy. And, and last but not least, um, once again, I insist that uh, many may be surprised by the ongoing debate in South Korea about the nuclearization of, uh, of the country with the word of the president, Yoon suk a few days ago that for the very first time hinted that in case North Korean uh, nuclear and else capabilities would keep increasing, South Korea might consider. Uh, it's not the first time that the South Korean president is uh, mentioning uh, such a scenario on the South Korean side. Uh, president Park Chung-hee actually in 1975 mention it, but it was in a very specific scenario in the case of the end of the U.S. extended deterrence. So in very, very specific scenarios. What is more worrying, I would say, in the debate currently in South Korea is that even though extended deterrence still work, that the lack of confidence in the extended deterrence or the idea that it is not enough, as some uh, South Korean official may have hinted, that spark actually the debate on the nuclearization. And of course, you cannot the ink, the debate with the growing short range systems, especially KN25 and others. Uh, I will remind everyone that uh, in I mean, a few days ago, the North Korean regime has hinted that KN25 could be used for tactical nuclear strikes. So to, to work 
also on the short range system is very important because some of the debate in South Korea is a direct consequence of North Korea developing not only tactic weapons, nuclear weapons, but also the vectors uh, and, and the platforms uh, on that. Thanks, Antoine. Uh, ben, do you want to add anything of this, on these uh, aspects? Uh, <clears throat> maybe just two quick points on, on the, the, the chemical angle. Uh, you know, that's, that's been sort of a black hole for many, many years. Uh, you know, we just don't have a good sense of the actuality of North Korea's chemical weapons activities. But uh, I think everyone has made the prudent assumption that they do have a substantial chemical weapons program and are compared, you know, prepared to deter and fight if necessary, you know, on the basis of North Korea using chemical weapons. Uh, and then on the, the South Korean nuclear business, I would just point out that there's also, you know, a very substantial domestic political angle to all the statements you're hearing in South Korea. So while, you know, it's something we need to keep an eye on, uh, and I'm sure that the, you know, the, the subtle messages are going in the right channels to dissuade the South Koreans from any serious consideration of this. Uh, we also have to, you know, recognize that there's a very substantial domestic political angle to, to what we're hearing right now in South Korea. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, may, maybe since we've been uh, talking about the question of proliferation of, of systems and technology, something that would be interested, uh, interesting to, to um, elaborate a little bit on, you mentioned in the report that those capacities are, are sophisticated. Uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, long word work that has uh, led to their development in, in North Korea. How can we compare this level of technology uh, in the DPRK today with other countries that may uh, provide this kind of technologies and especially Iran that you know also quite, quite well? Uh, could you give us a sense of how developed in comparison with other systems? Uh, well, it's rather difficult because uh, Iran and North Korea uh, have chosen different paths. And uh, um, uh, to be frank, um, uh, Iran has some, uh, some good capabilities in terms uh, of quasi ballistic missile, but uh, mostly uh, around the 4110 and its evolution. And it's uh, it's rather different that, uh, than the kind twenty three uh, and twenty four, and uh, as uh, for the kind twenty five, the technology seems to be uh, strictly North Korean. So uh, the, the two countries are uh, having different path, and. Um, uh, if, if you take the, the CAN 23 and the CAN 25, it seems to show that uh, North Korea uh, have, have been able to get uh, some uh, very, very uh, modern technologies that uh, Iran maybe uh, does not possess. Uh, and so um, uh, it used to be uh, feasible to compare the two countries. Uh, on some of the programs. Uh, for these programs in particular, uh, it seems that North Korea uh, have a very national path, most probably with the help of some countries, uh, even if you cannot say explicitly. Uh, and it's not the case, uh, or it's not the same path in, uh, in uh, Iran. Uh, what would be very problematic uh, is a correlation of uh, both technologies. It would be a real problem. Thanks. Uh, Antoine, maybe we can finish. We have a couple of questions that are kind of uh, dealing with this issue of how these trends, these developments can uh, fit or, or rather not fit, of course, with the ob objective we had of, of the denuclearization of the DPRK. Uh, can you let us know a little bit of the sense of how um, so, so, of course, we focused on conventional um, aspects, but we also mentioned that the role as, uh, as uh, weapons that could carry uh, nuclear weapons, and it's a very important angle. Can you give us a bit the sense of how these developments interact with this political objective that remains uh, official, but it seems less and less uh, tangible on the ground? 
once again, I would say there is two very worrying trends. The first one is the development of the capacities and the study, of course, address it. The second is the lack of unity of the international community on that. Uh, once again, what happened in May 2022 is unprecedented. For the very, very first time, Russia and China vetoed a project of the resolution at the United Nations Security Council that was condemning and sanctioning North Korea ballistic uh, programs. So this is a very worrowing trend because who knows if there is a nuclear test in the coming month, whether Russia and uh, China will not or, or will or will not veto uh, a project of a resolution. So this is a very worrowing trend because in addition to the green capacities, of course, there is a lack of unity of the international uh, community. So are we far today from the decreasation? Of course, but I would say there is nothing new on that. Uh, what we need, of course, is to try to resume discussion uh, or even before talking about negotiation. Uh, COVID is not helping because the closure of North Korea, the impossibility of North Korean diplomats to travel overseas is, of course, a, a huge issue. Uh, Europe hosted not the EU, but some member state and some organization within Europe hosted some discussion back in 2016, 2017, 2018, etc. Uh, especially organization in Sweden, some in Switzerland, etc. And, and there is no, uh, I would say, visibility in the coming month of any of these kind of facilitating uh, events to be to be organized because once again, North can diplomats, North can negotiators, Tresanui, the lead negotiator, etc., uh, cannot travel. Uh, overseas. So, so this is very worrying trend. I, I will be kind of, uh, up to, I mean, kind of realistic. Uh, and to be realistic today is to be kind of pessimistic. Uh, the role of the EU is facilitating this negotiation is, of course, limited. Some actors could play a role, maybe not the EU uh, per se. And there, but there is a need uh, to assess uh, what's going on and to understand that uh, no matter uh, the, the, the negotiation or else, the denigration in the short term is much more, uh, I mean, it's very much uh, compromised. Uh, then there is a debate on whether we should move from denigration to arms control. Uh, that's uh, a debate that, that should be held, of course, but at the political level, uh, the CVID, the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula uh, cannot be uh, just uh, given rid of. Uh, and, and there is, of course, this kind of political constraint that how do we move forward? What is the trajectory? Uh, what are the many steps that should be, uh, of course, uh, initiated before one day in a very long and hypothetical uh, future, maybe reaching the denuclearization and for North Korea not to have a weapon of mass destruction. But, but once again, I would say that uh, I'm kind of uh, pessimistic because there is this two very worrying trends, the development of the capacities and at the same time, the inability of the international community to unite and be cohesive on how to address uh, the issue. Thank you very much, Antoine. Uh, Christian Van, do you have anything you want to add before we, we conclude? Christian? No? No, no. Uh, <laughs> just to say that I agree completely with, uh, with uh, what Stefan said uh, about comparison between North Korea and Iran um, and uh, about the, the capacity, the production capacity of missiles, uh, uh, which will, will be another study. Thanks. Then any last word on your side? No, you're good. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Well, in that case, I will uh, thank everybody for uh, this discussion. Many thanks, of course, to our panelists and audience. Uh, I will really uh, encourage you to download the study that we will uh, re-download ourselves, actually, because it seems to be a, a technical issue on the way it appears on some uh, browsers. So I'll make sure it's fixed in, in a few minutes. Uh, we also have an executive summary, a, a four-page uh, summary, if you, if you need. And we, of course, look forward uh, to future interactions and exchanges on these topics of, as we keep uh, focusing on developments pertaining to missile proliferation. Many thanks again, and a good afternoon to, or good evening to you all. Thank you.